And now it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Ben. So um, Ben has previously spent some time at UOW back in 2017. He's a professor of archaeology at the University of Washington, and his um, area of expertise is listed there. Um, but the main reason that we're having Ben speak to us today is because he's interested in reproducible research and open science. And he's directing a, a minor in data science at the University of Washington. But Ben is a real advocate for re reproducible research and publishes on how to do re reproducible research. And um, he, he does that from his discipline area. So his uh, material is easy to interpret for those of you who are not strictly from a data science background. So, and he's a great presenter. So I'm welcoming Ben to talk to us today. So I'll hand over to you, I'll just stop sharing. Great, and if you great. want to share your screen, thanks. All right, thank you so much. Is that uh, visible to everyone? Yep. Great, thanks so much. So thanks a lot, Marika. It's a, it's a real a great honor and a real pleasure to uh, be speaking to you. Uh, um, partly because uh, I have a special personal connection to UOW as a future ARC Future Fellow there, and uh, really enjoyed getting to know um, people working on on um, on statistics there, as well as the as my colleagues in the Archeolo Center for Archaeological Science there too, and enjoyed uh, some software carpentry, getting involved in software carpentry workshops, teaching R there. I won't be talking at all about um, archaeology, really about the sort of higher level concern about sort of making the quantitative work. Uh, reproducible, but from I think probably most relevant if you are in the social sciences generally, uh, probably if you're uh, if you're and you know maybe some natural sciences in in sort of moderate to low density data kind of fields. Uh, you know I'm not doing like hardly I'm not doing um, you know astronomy level kind of uh, more than, a lot of what I'm talking about is not going to be very useful to those people. So if you're in the social sciences, maybe some natural sciences, this should be quite relevant to you and probably what you will hear will either be very validating and you'll be like, yes, I had heard about this, that sounds good, I should definitely invest in it. Uh, or maybe provoke quite the opposite reactions like, well, you've got the complete wrong toolkit or whatever. And I'll be quite keen to know what you uh, what you suggest uh, instead. But I think what I've got is a fairly good um, like convergence on things that are fairly low friction, fairly good community of support uh, and kind of, you know, a sensible sort of uh, thing to do. So let's, let's, here's what I'm going to do. Oh, by the way, I'm on, I'm speaking to you from Seattle, um, which is the, uh, the traditional lands of the Coast Salish uh, people. So we'll talk about what is reproducible research and you, you likely already have some notion of that. I will just cover what is sort of prevailing and um, competing ideas. And I'll introduce this notion of layers, which I think is a really helpful way to kind of talk about like a spectrum or levels of being reproducible to kind of validate the idea that it's okay if maybe you cannot be like 100% reproducible all the time with your research, sometimes not, not practical, feasible, affordable, ethical even to be reproducible. And then sort of suggest some things that are the things you can do with tools that are easy to adopt and free uh, and widely used right now. So what is it and why, it's, why is it important? There's a, um, a ni very nice visualization on some of these kind of R words uh, from the Turing Way project, which you may have heard of, and they have a very nice kind of uh, book in progress on the topic. And uh, just to sort of draw your attention in here, to the way I think about it, and it's common in many fields, but not universal, is that where you take the same data set uh, and apply the same analysis as say the authors of a study. So in this sense, it's like uh, a journal article is kind of the key unit of reproducibility we can often think of. And then there's a data set that accompanies that and a, and a code um, compendium or file that goes along with it. And you can put all those things together and recreate basically the same results that are in the paper. Oh, someone else is joining me on the on the pen there. <laughs> um, and so that's what I think is reproducible, what the meaning of reproducible. There are, there are courses value to making your work uh, have these qualities as well, but my focus is really on this part here because I think a lot of the other parts um, flow from there and you know, reusability and transparency comes out of there as well. A couple of nice um, sort of nuances about reproducibility. This is Victoria Stodden over here that some of you probably know of. She's uh, a uh, very prominent scholar in the field of reproducibility, mostly in the in the um, sort of physical and natural sciences. 
and has written extensively, especially survey data, like why do people, what do people value about making them re reproducible or not? And she's identified these three different kind of dimensions, computational, which is really my focus here as well, and in, in, in what I sort of enjoy putting effort into, empirical reproducibility as an archaeologist, um, my example of this is like, I will go to the museum, I will measure the artifacts of somebody else, measure if I will get the same measurements they measure, or I will excavate the same archaeological site that someone else excavated, I will excavate near to them, and I will find the same sequence of cultural change, for example. This is sort of bench top or observational things. And then statistical reproducibility is a bit, another kind of specialization that probably many of you know much more about than me, about things like p-hacking and harking and these sort of technical or statistical uh, details but this is these this particular one here is what I'm focusing on uh, today so the, the sort of current state of uh, of you know computational reproducibility especially in social and natural sciences revolving around our you know communicating our results which generally is done through a journal article a book chapter or monograph and and the way things are structured is, is the assumption that this is a sufficient way to communicate our results our findings in order to be reproducible, and you probably recognize this is a very ancient journal article from the uh, from the from the seventeenth century. I don't recall exactly which one. It looks like something to do with optics. So the question, my question is, is this sufficient to be reproducible? And you can probably guess that my answer is, is most cases, no, it's not the case. There'll be some rare cases where a study is sufficiently small and finite that you can read. That there's enough. Um, you know, the details can be communicated in a journal article, but most of the work that most of us are doing, even though it's not, maybe not highly computationally intensive, uh, we can't fit all of the decisions that we make around the data into the space of a, of a journal article or book chapter. A monograph is a sort of special case because, you know, you can have the monograph and then you can have a, a, maybe a repository that accompanies it that, because you have a lot of control, but the journal articles, the journal may be very fussy about what, what is in the article and mentioned by the article and so on. So this is kind of a focal point of the problem and where a lot of my kind of, um, I guess, like activism around reproducibility goes. So I'm on some publication committee for the Society of American Archaeology and every year at their general meeting, I say, you know, we should have a reproducibility policy and open data policy and so on. And, and every year we sort of inch closer uh, towards that. And I recommend that for you, if you're involved in professional societies to look for good examples in other disciplines uh, where they seem to have a great policy around publishing reproducible research and bring it into your research community through the editorial board or publication committee or so on and uh, make bring raise people's awareness about that. So as you probably have anticipated, I think the journal article by itself is not sufficient uh, for, for you know uh, communicating research in a way that makes our research sustainable and useful to our research community and to the public generally. Here's the article up here. This is from the Turing way, I think. And then here are all the other things that are, that sort of are necessary for another person to know about to reproduce or reuse or extend uh, the results that we may have presented in our journal article. So a significant gap, uh, I will say, and, and, and many other people between um, apparently reproducible work, what you read about in a journal article, and then all the other things that are necessary to make it so, so that you could read create one of the graphs or tables that you find in there or plug in your data to their method to kind of get it, get us, get a similar um, uh, um, implementation. So this is, and now I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what, what is the sort of tooling that most people have converged on, I think, in the social sciences that makes it possible to sort of put the, all of the iceberg up above the, uh, the waterline. So let's try to motivate some of the importance of this. Um, why Why sh is it worth to put in this effort? Because it is a lot, it is very time consuming and most people will not recognize that time. And if you're an early career researcher or a student and your advisor is saying, why haven't you done this yet? And you're saying, well, I'm, I'm cleaning up the code. They will not recognize that as a val valid use of your time. And if you're, you know, if you're preparing for tenure or promotion and you've got this amazing code repository, uh, you know, there's a chance that your promotion committee might not see that as a good use of your time. So I, I feel it's important to talk about some of the motivations. So making re reproducible research, putting the code and data in place of other people and see it, it's important to support accumulation of reliable claims about the world, a very fundamental concept of you know, what, what it means to be doing science, like demarcation of science versus non-scientific activities. And you may recognize over here, this is the vacuum pump that was designed by uh, Robert Boyle, who was one of these people at the sort of birth of 
Western science, one of the pe first people to write journal articles and so on. He, one of his distinctive practices was writing things down in such exquisite detail with the view, his vision was that he could write things down so in so much detail that someone else could do the exact motions on the laboratory bench and sort of and um, create the same kind of apparatus he did. I'm enjoying hearing the sound of the birds, which I never hear around here, those ones. <laughs> and even to the point of like, he would describe certain dents in his vacuum pump and it was that, with the idea, in case they were important and someone else wanted to like recreate these dents. So accumulation of rubber yeah. events, yeah. Cir circulating these details that, um, that other people need to sort of uh, recreate, um, validate and extend discoveries. Yeah. And particularly, yeah. Let's see, can I mute that? Oh, I can't, cannot. Anyway, a particularly famous example of, uh, of uh, an, a, you know, something that we would prefer had not accumulated in the scientific record, and probably many of you know of this, Reinhardt and Rogoff talking about um, uh, GDP and economic growth. And just as an example of a sort of unfortunate result that did accumulate and did have a policy effect. And they uh, determined um, the higher uh, debt to GDP ratios, looking at like national economies were associated with lower levels of growth. And they identified a certain threshold here, and this is their, this is their result right here. Around just over 90% of debt to GDP ratio, that's when negative growth happened. So they, this was a result they published uh, in a book and many other places, and, uh, and it had substantial effect on sort of uh, national financial policy, particularly in Greece, you, you probably remember. And then a bunch of, a uh, couple of graduate students got a hold of the spreadsheet actually directly from the authors. Uh, that was all very amicable and found this, uh, this detail here where the selection in Excel had, uh, was not dragged down sufficiently far enough uh, to, to sort of reflect what the analysis was meant to be doing. And when those students kind of did, did the analysis in the way that it was intended to, they found that kind of a strongly uh, opposite, uh, I think this, this is the SES, strongly opposite result. This is an example of, a, of a, something that we would prefer not to have accumulated in the scientific record because it had this, this unfortunate uh, effect. Uh, and perhaps if the authors had been more transparent at the outset, it, this would have been something that could have been corrected earlier and, and perhaps not gone on to uh, cause uh, major austerity politics. So accumulation of reliable claims, uh, you know, behaving in a reproducible way perhaps can support the accumulation of reliable claims. Avoiding the duplication of effort and waste of resources, probably you already can think of examples of where someone has done something and then only to find that it, it, it was already done five years ago or a PhD student who, who completes a dissertation and then finds that a sort of an industry um, lab or something has done already done that thing and never published it. And these things are unfortunate. Uh, and, and, you know, we would prefer to be spending our time on things that are, you know, are not duplicating and don't appear to be wasteful. And if we can communicate more transparently, even especially about null results, uh, then we can avoid this. You probably have heard of the, uh, you know, what is it called? The bottom drawer kind of uh, situation where, um, an observation is made or experiment is done, the results are very exciting, it doesn't get published, and nobody knows about it. And then someone else goes and does the same thing and, and it's sort of repeated and, and duplication and waste. New areas of research. And I think um, some disciplines have been, for, for some disciplines is not entirely new, but in my field of archeology, span still quite new where uh, if, if several groups are compiling their data and releasing it in a way that's sort of interoperable, we can then combine all those together and find patterns and ask questions that were not possible at a scale that were not possible before. You know, I think astronomers and physicists have got this worked out like building giant particle accelerators and giant telescopes out of necessity, they've had to combine sort of forces, but in uh, many social sciences, I think, um, and smaller areas of natural sciences, being more transparent facilitates synthesis and questions that, are, uh, that haven't been, are not possible uh, when people are just keeping things to themselves on their own computer. And finally, I think this is kind of a, you know, we are becoming increasingly uh, alert to questions of diversity and inclusiveness uh, and equity. And I think there's a case to be made that behaving, doing reproducible research supports these initiatives by making um, code and data available. You know, people outside of our rich institutions uh, can then access those materials to support their own research and support their own education. And, and as I work in, uh, Southeast Asia is my sort of geographic region for my archaeological work, and I often think about my colleagues there and you know, their universities don't have a lot of opportunities to do computation intensive work. And I think if we can develop a strong habit of making that stuff available, you know, there's some 
higher potential for them to do to sort of self-teach or discover this material and incorporate it in. If we never really share anything, they will never have that opportunity. So I think there's a there's definitely a case to be made, and, and perhaps even around the, the sort of decolonization of certain disciplines that have been historically very extractive of low and middle income countries to kind of return some of those things in a, in a digital form. Uh, the tools and techniques and practices of reproducibility can support some of these concepts. So there's definitely some intersection of perhaps these ideas that maybe are not, uh, not, not, not bedfellows at first thought. So now I want to, so hopefully I've kind of motivated the importance of this and, and maybe generated some sense of uh, value to it. So now I want to pursue this idea of layers. And this comes from, you know, discussions of these two uh, people, Carl Bodeker and Noam Ross, who are very active in the R community, and they're both um, ecologists. Carl is at uh, Berkeley, and Noam works for like an infectious disease research institute, I think it is. And they have been they have kind of uh, introduced this idea of layers in which you sort of have an easy, easy to hard, more to less effort, and so on. And I've tried to sort of organize some of the conversations that they and I have been having, especially around tooling to do with R. To um, in, the, in this context of layers, and I think that onion is a particularly good, like vegetable, to think about layers because uh, you know the first layer of the onion, the dry brown skin, is relatively easy to work with and not at all painful or difficult. Doesn't make your eye water at all. But as you get closer to the center of the onion, uh, by then your your eyes are really watering and you've done quite a lot of work and it's maybe a bit physically unpleasant. Uh, and I think that's quite a good way of thinking about these layers of reproducibility as we go from the first layer through to the, the fifth layer that I will talk about in terms of the perhaps uh, challenge, frustration and uh, frust uh, difficulty that the company does. So let's get on. So my first layer, uh, by which I mean like the most accessible, the least time consuming, the one that we can reasonably expect most people to get into without too much um, you know, modification of their existing practices, something undergraduates can reasonably expect to do is simply to switch from a point and click kind of workflow using a you know, commercial, expensive commercial software to a, a scripting and workflow using an open source software. And I, I will talk about R because it's what I know and use very well, but if you're using Python or Julia or whatever, they will have some very similar analog that I'm sure you can mentally substitute as I go through here. And, and you may have heard of Quarto, just recently, it's kind of emerged by the same team that are writing that have been working on R Markdown, like mostly in the R Studio company. Quarto is a similar kind of literate programming framework that now much more is much more language ag agnostic, and Python and Julia and, and R and so on can all like interoperate within the same document uh, very very nicely. But I will talk about R Markdown for now because I'm most familiar. I'm just starting to switch over to Quarto. So this is kind of the first layer, moving a, away from point and click into a scripted workflow um, and using an open source environment that doesn't, you know, that's inaccessible to people who don't have a sort of a huge research or software budget or whatever. So this is the easy, the on-ramp uh, that we can reasonably expect an undergraduate and we teach undergraduates to do. And, and I think this is um, an easy, uh, easy one to, uh, to recommend. And probably many of you are like, yes, that is, uh, that is uh, easy to agree with. An example of R Markdown, in case you're not familiar with it, you will draft the text uh, over here. Uh, and then this is an example of output. In this case, it's HTML format. And you can, so you can see this is like a plain, plain text document over here where the typing happens and some basic uh, syntax for links. This is the, uh, the indicating inline R code. And so this is code that's appearing in the middle of the sentence. And it's indicated by this back tick and the letter R, and you can see it just it calculates the number of rows on the data set empty cars. And when the code is when the markdown document is rendered into the output format, in this case HTML, but you can have PDF and Word and other things, you can see the code is run and the number is put in there. And then here you probably recognize a code block indicated by these three back ticks fencing it off. And the letter R here is signifying R language. So you can put Python for Python language and shell and other things. And then a little bit of code that draws this plot here. So this is a very classic kind of literate programming situation. Uh, um, and this is how my undergraduate students do their assignments in classes that are quantitative. Uh, and, uh, and you know, the Python Jupyter notebooks have a very similar kind of uh, weaving of code and text throughout. 
And so this is an ideal format, I would say for, uh, you know, you can write it, your supplementary file for a journal article in our markdown, if you're working with co-authors who are not entirely on board with it, or you can write the whole journal article in our markdown, render it to Microsoft Word and submit it to the journal if, you, uh, if you're feeling uh, game for a challenge. And I, I certainly have enjoyed that challenge for, for a few journal articles, but it's not something I, um, you know, doesn't, isn't the right thing for every occasion, uh, especially working with co-authors who are, you know, or senior authors who are, um, you prefer to use Word. Okay, so point and click, uh, stylish code with comments, uh, avoiding, oh, using the here package, a few thoughts on this, uh, this first layer, the here package allows you to avoid absolute paths. So absolute paths are a bit of a reproducibility road bump, I guess. So you have a path to a file on your computer or your cluster or whatever, and then once, if you share that code, of course, the path won't work on anyone else's because it's likely unique to your particular set of your computer. This package helps to deal with that in a very, very smooth and pleasant way. And then when you've written all this out, you can include that code file there, markdown file there, script uh, in as a supplementary file for, for your journal article, for example, or deposit it on a data repository. And you might think, oh, it's not really a data file. It doesn't really belong there. It's fine. It's very normal to put them there. No one, I've never seen any concern or criticism about putting a script file on a data repository. I'm talking about such things like an institution repository that a university library will maintain or zenodo.org or Figshare and so on. The nice thing about this is it can be a citable object by itself. And uh, you know the supplementary information is often not attended to by peer reviewers. They may not look at it and journals sometimes just lose them or, or they relabel the files so that the paths no longer, the file names no longer work at all. And, and a reviewer or a reader has no idea like which CSV file is to be read and at what point because all the file names have been changed by the, by the journalist. So this is an option, but not one I recommend. I think this depositing on the repository where you as the author have control over the file names and the, and the, um, the location sign is the way to go. All right, so I have this kind of, um, this kind of ranking system for each of my five steps in terms of the pain that they're, this is a, this is an actual pain scale that's often used uh, by um, medical professionals and then over here in terms of the this is the like a reproducibility sort of spectrum and I will rank this as a fairly low pain low on the reproducibility pain scale for the researcher relatively low effort and complexity you know I think if, if we can if we're frequently teaching undergraduates this this is a fair judgment. And it generally has some, some good benefits. So the researcher, and by doppelgangers, I mean like people who wanna do that kind of research for themselves, kind of reuse or extend or so on. Uh, but, but you know, there are a whole bunch of things that are not captured in a simple script, but which gives it this relatively low kind of uh, ranking in terms of long-term reproducibility. So you may reference some libraries, some packages uh, in the code and note you may in this, if you just have a single script file, you won't be capturing the package version numbers. And then there could be a breaking change, and that could um, that could make it difficult for people five years from now to to reproduce if they can't access the exact package version. So, but we will that will be one of the deeper layers of the onion managing this. So this is and this is quite an illuminating study of that this exact kind of problem. Uh, uh, simply using code or sharing the code file is not enough for sort of robust long term reproducibility. And here's this uh, Kohlberg study where they it's a computer science study, computer systems. And they grabbed 600 uh, bits of code, studies, code from studies, and then attempted to run them and make things happen. And uh, only a fairly small fraction uh, could be successfully run in the end. And they had to have an interesting discussion of the, all the reasons why they couldn't um, get, get things going. And one of the key reasons is uh, software dependencies. Things are not sufficiently documented to recreate that environment that the original work was done on. So when now we are, We've passed through this first layer of the onion where we're talking about the R script file as a basic first step to reproducibility. And if that's all that you do in your research work, I still think it's fine and worth celebrating. And you can call yourself someone who does reproducible research, even if this is where you stop and you say, okay, I see you have five steps. I'm gonna do one. I will say totally fine. That's great and, and thanks a lot. But if you're game, uh, here's step two. It's about um, capturing a bit, a little bit more of the computation environment that the work is done on to give another person, you know, uh, in the future or a, a colleague, a better chance of, of running your code the first time and making it work. 
So the current state of the art in the R environment for this kind of thing is called the, as I'm not sure of the exact pronunciation, I usually say RNV, but maybe people say RENV, but it doesn't matter. And some of the things that, what, what this package does uh, for you, what it gives you an isolation. So it gives you a, its own, your package, your project has its own set uh, of its own package library, its own set of libraries with those particular versions separate from another project you have on your computer that might use uh, more recent ones. So for example, let's say we started a project in you know, 2017 when I was in Wollongong and packages, I can freeze that kind of package uh, environment using this RN package, all the packages there, but I'd like to keep updating my packages on my computer because I'm excited about all the updates. My 2017 project will remain with its uh, kind of historical versions. Uh, thanks to the RN package, it will keep it isolated from all the new packages that I'm also using for other projects. So this also another advantage is uh, portability. So I can give you my project and you can put it on your computer with whichever versions of packages you have, and it will allow you to recreate this um, environment of package versions the same as I have, which of course, uh, both of these things lead to a, uh, a sort of smooth and improved uh, reproducibility of the research. Exact package versions are recorded. So within the R environment, this, uh, works wonders for kind of keeping track of the package versions, which is really, um, really important. You probably have, if you've been using R for a couple of years, you probably have experienced some major breaking changes in some of your favorite packages and and, and suffered through some of the time that it takes to, to update your code to handle things like that. I recall um, ggplot2 having some pretty serious changes uh, a few years ago, and it was a real nuisance. And that this that was before this package was available. There was a predecessor called Packrat, which was not nearly as nice to use. R is a much uh, much improved kind of um, sort of second generation of Packrat, if you happen to remember that. So this is a great um, RN is a great way to to capture and communicate package versions for your project. Another option for doing this is to use the R package structure itself. And so this may seem a bit unnatural or unintuitive, you know, what you think about the R package structure is like, this is the way we bundle up method and we then we share method with each other. But I'm gonna make the case that you can kind of overload it with not just method, but also like results and and kind of media, you know, the figures and, and text of your results. So I would call this, uh, you know, use the notion of a compendium where the the R package has a place for all the things that we would normally want to share with each other about like a journal article. You can put uh, data here and you can put your uh, manuscript there. You can also have um, metadata, the authors, uh, date and so on. And then you can have instructions to people on uh, what to do with it or where to find more information. Of course, a license, which is nice for communicating your intentions about reuse. So. The R package structure itself, and really minimally only actually needs a description to be a valid R package, but of course we need some other things to put our manuscript to data and so on. It has the advantage of being very formal and standardized. So if we are all R users, uh, then most of us will recognize where to find the things that we want to find, where are the data, where will the, uh, the markdown document be. You could also use the vignettes folder for this. This is a non-standard folder for an R package. And so in within the description file is where there's this sort of natural place to document the package dependencies, package names and version numbers that your analysis depends on. And so another user can study the description file and manually install the packages, or they can install your compendium package and have the, have the machine take care of all that as well. So you have these kind of two options for handling the second layer, use the R package structure or use this RN package, which is which kind of has its own method of, of dealing with that. It's probably a little bit simpler. I would say if, if you're hearing about this sort of second layer thing for the first time, start with RN as your kind of starting point. And then if you feel more adventurous, look into making uh, compendium packages and you may want to use the dev tools package and use this package to do that. We also have made a package quite similar to dev tools called RR tools, which is a package that generates a template, a research compendium template package. So it will, it will make a package that looks a bit like this for you, take some information from you via prompts and then allow, and then you just sort of start typing in your R markdown file and write your journal article and the rest is, uh, is easy. And we've written about this package and some of the motivation for it in this, uh, this article here. And so once you have 
this second layer, then in your uh, report or your, your thesis or your journal article, you can have a paragraph like this, which I try to squeeze in at the end of the method sections of most of my manuscripts, uh, which just makes this declaration. So it's all very well, you know, to write the code and put it on a on a repository and put this effort in, but you need to alert people to the fact that it's there. Otherwise, uh, you may never they may never encounter it. So I try to include a section like this in the, toward the end of my, the method section of my manuscript in the main text of the manuscript, so people can see it to tell them that our code is on a certain repository. There's a DOI and the reason why I've done this and then also using uh, Git for version control for, um, you know, and telling the reader like, what, what have I done and why have I done this? And you also can grab it, it's fine, I don't mind. Because for many people, you know, the default expectation is when reading a manuscript that everything is secret and private and they have, can have to beg and probably be to be declined. The author, you know, they're available on reasonable requests and, and many times they, the request is not not reply to at all. So I figured by putting it up front to the reader, they will get a clear sense of what's there and what my and what my uh, expectations are about their use of it, which is which is basically go for it in many cases. And of course there are data sets um, where I where all of the data are not there, like locations of archaeological sites. I will not include that because that may invite them to be damaged and um, you know personal identifying information won't go in there. In that case, this sentence, these paragraphs look slightly different. But this, I don't believe there are many cases where we need to not share the R code. I think even if we can't share the full data or any data, there's still value in sharing the analysis code uh, for people who want to study the details of the decisions that you've made. So this second layer, by the time we're in the second layer, we're kind of, we're starting to be a bit less maybe happy about the amount of time and effort that we're having to put into things, a little bit more troubleshooting required on code. But the trade-off is, of course, um, that you know we're moving further up the long-term, improving the long-term reproducibility of our work. So low to middle on the pain scale, moderate effort and complexity, I would say. But there's benefit for future reuse and new users because it's going to be easier for them to recreate the environment in which the code will work, you know, five or ten years from now. Okay, now we're getting kind of into the middle of the onion, I guess we can say the third, the third layer and. And you know, by you know, if you're cutting up the onion in the kitchen by now, you will be you know noticing it and probably a bit of uh, tears in your eyes and uh, nose running a little bit, and it's kind of becoming a you know an, an ordeal of its own. So, what's in this third layer of sort of increasing challenge and time consuming? Uh, the targets package. So this is another package like RN, um, which is an equivalent. Uh, sort of an implementation or a conceptualization of Make. And you may know Make as like a workflow managing software out of uh, Linux, right? For compiling software or running certain sequence of operations. It's its own, I think it's its own language. Um, but, and so Targets is, is an implementation of that concept that is all R. And so I had tried this many times, tried to use Make and it all seemed very good and you know, people spoke very highly of it. But I just really, it turns out I am an impossible monoglot. I can't seem to really learn any other language at all. So when targets appeared as the workflow package for R, I became very excited and thought finally I can enjoy these make sort of advantages without actually having to learn a second uh, environment or, or language. So workflow documentation is really what is happening, what this package enables. Uh, and caching, which I'm sure you know is kind of a hideous problem um, in computer science and and in, in creating reproducible workflows of any complexity, even in ones that last a couple of minutes, you need to think about caching to, to, uh, to sort of get things done in a, in a reasonable time. So workflows and pipelines, um, the targets package is about creating analytical pipelines that avoid you having to redo steps over and over again that don't change. So if you have a you know, realistically complex project uh, and you're working on some parts some days and other parts other days, and you want to sort of rerun the whole thing, um, the targets package is going to allow you to just skip running the code of things you haven't changed that day. So it's uh, it's very useful for long running computations, make like pipeline toolkit uh, for R. So we can maintain a reproducible workflow without reproducing, repeating ourselves, without rerunning code that we haven't changed since the last time it ran. So skips costly runtime. This is a, and I'm sure most of you are probably doing things that have run times that are more than a few seconds. And so this probably is going to be, could be quite valuable to you. If you're using, writing in Markdown and using NITAR caching, 
Uh, you probably have experienced how that can glitch a little bit and be a bit tricky to kind of keep track of. Uh, targets will be a huge leap ahead in sort of elegance and simplicity in terms of caching if you're already writing in our markdown. Uh, and then it has it has built in targets some quite nice methods of visualizing the workflow and what has been run and what has been skipped and what has changed and what hasn't. Definitely a very thoughtful and very kind of uh, sophisticated package for managing um, managing complex workflows. And it does require you to be uh, to really thoroughly commit to a functional workflow in R. So every unit of activity has to be a function. And for, you know, if you're sort of committed to the idiom idiomatic way of working in R, that will be very natural. Uh, but if you use R in a more imperative way, this, that, this will be a this will, may take a little bit of getting used to. Right, so this is the kind of contrast. If you, you may operate like this and have a series of numbered scripts and targets kind of uh, encourages you to take a slightly different approach rather than sort of numbering things and then running one, two, three, four, or running one and skipping two because you already did it yesterday and going straight to three. It encourages you to have to organize things into functions, which is very R, as I'm sure many of you know, very idiomatic to R. And then, um, and then you have this sort of, uh, this is the equivalent of the make file, the targets file. But then um, these are the inputs, and then these are the functions that you have previously uh, written. And it will work through each step of the um, targets file. And if something has been, hasn't changed since you last run it, we'll simply skip that and give you a nice little report afterwards. It's very elegant, very thoughtful. I really recommend that if you do, do work of any sort of complexity that takes more than a couple of seconds uh, to run. So it's quite, quite nice. Okay, so, but however, it is, uh, you know, now we're definitely getting into discomfort zone here. Um, you know, if you're not accustomed to working very, writing very functional code, uh, this would be quite a different sort of way of thinking about writing code. And, and uh, you know, with our Markdown, uh, our Markdown, you, so we're, if you're working with our Markdown already, you're accustomed to knitting being like the, the action that kind of does it all. In this case, it's uh, it's running the targets file and knitting is just one of the steps that occurs at the end of the targets file. So it's a, it's a little bit of like rearrangement of the ordering of things and, and where does the running of the script sort of happen. So so definitely some sort of cognitive and, and practical adjustments required to commit to this kind of workflow uh, organization, a little bit of getting used to um, and some sort of maybe unique kinds of troubleshooting around that that maybe you're not accustomed, maybe not be accustomed to if you, if you haven't, not familiar with this sort of make style thinking. But the upshot is that your work, you're sort of forced to work in a much more organized way, I think, by committing heavily to this very functional um, approach. And of course, the, it's just another kind of tool to get familiar with. Um, uh, but the, I think the advantage, it takes advantage of the idioms of R to make things more transparent to other R users. Um, and, um, Sort of elevates the whole project up here as well because the work the entire workflow is kind of being managed and taken care of so middle high on pain scale you do need to have a high tolerance of functional programming and, and but there are benefits uh, for computation intensive use, especially things that require time to run you can save a lot of time things can be easily um, transferred from a sort of laptop scale to a cluster scale using targets and there's some quite nice target libraries around fairly popular time consuming, uh, um, uh, like some kinds of Bayesian R packages that have been adapted for targets as well. So it's really an active area of development and one that one I recommend if you do things that are time consuming. Okay, we're nearly at the center uh, of, the, of the onion. Uh, and, and I think this is for me personally, so what are we up to about here somewhere? Uh, this is really uh, by far the most painful, uh, frustrating element of attempting to make my work reproducible. For, so, you know, I will, I will teach this to undergraduates without a second thought. I will do this with graduate students. I will expect every graduate student to be able to handle this you know, with, with some instruction and guidance, but without having had a, a background in, in computing or programming or anything. But this one here, I really don't, I'm not comfortable to tell anyone, to ask anyone to do this except myself, because it's such a fiddle often encounter so many unfamiliar issues. And it's just a difficult, kind of difficult to sort of visualize a computer inside a computer and the file paths and so on. So, so painful, uh, I will freely confess. So you may be familiar, but in case not, um, 
Docker is kind of an advancement on the concept of virtual machines, virtual machine where you sort of run the operating system inside or on an operating system. And Docker does something equivalent, but but sort of shares um, or allows a much sort of deeper connection to the operating system. And it's much, uh, it doesn't carry this entire operating system with it. So, you know, I'm running a OS X computer right here. I could have a virtual machine running Windows on it. With Docker, I can, I will have a virtual machine that runs probably um, Linux, but it's a much smaller um, sort of um, program and takes up much less space on my hard drive, much less um, memory because of how it shares many of the um, components with the operating system. So it's really can be thought of in some kind of ways, a very streamlined, very efficient um, virtual machine. And it's kind of taken over, taken the um, you know, um, IT industry by storm and how efficient it is and how much isolation it gives as well. So let's see, a shipping, shipping container kind of analogy is how it's, how it's kind of often talked about hardware and platform agnostic. So we can run a little instance of, uh, you know, often people will use uh, Linux uh, on any kind of hardware, any kind of software, thanks to Docker, pretty much. So tool for neatly packaging software, moving it from machine to machine. So it's a great, uh, it's often people like it for scaling from sort of prototyping in a small system to, to doing a production scale activity. Uh, yes, so a Docker file, is this kind of plain text uh, instruction that kind of documents some of the system dependencies. So in a previous layer of the onion, we talked about documenting the R packages, you know, the names of the package and the package versions using RN package or the package R package system itself, the description metadata file. The Docker file takes care of that at the level of the whole computer, right? So now we are talking about uh, you know, which operating system are you using and which libraries outside of R are, um, are, are necessary to make this whole thing work. So as you may know, many R packages depend on um, other libraries, which are often installed at the time the R package is installed, or if you're running on a, a Unix type of system, you may need to install them uh, separately. So the Docker, um, file can help you to manage that and communicate that to other people. So RN will take care of all that stuff within R and Docker takes care of all the stuff outside of R on the computer. So, and these are some of the packages you may know that require fairly heavy duty dependent, like a uh, system level dependencies in order to, to work, to do Bayesian work or uh, geographic information system work. So it's taking care of this non-R dependencies for you. And then you can bundle in these other things to, you know, if you want to make a PDF, uh, you will need LaTeX and uh, other conversion into other formats, Pandoc, all of that can be bundled into this, this Docker image. And then when you run that, you have what the container and it's and it kind of captures the, the greater computational environment um, in a very kind of isolated and compact and transparent way. There are some transparency issues, but Docker, so you can, the Docker file can often start by pulling another Docker image that someone else has pre-made and you don't, you have to sort of do quite a bit of digging to maybe find out what's the, what are the versions and the things that are installed in that image. Um, but but um, for some of the lower level things that perhaps are unique to your analysis, the Docker file can capture that pretty well. So as I mentioned earlier, now we are at the quite uncomfortable level. This is kind of like breakthrough pain level, I would say. Like when it comes for me to start uh, engaging with a Docker file on one of my research projects, I will, I will recoil and I will look for thing, other things to do rather than attend to why the Docker file, why the Docker container is not working very well. Because it's just, just for me personally, I'm, you know, it's another language I'm not familiar with outside of R. And system level operations is not, not something I'm very comfortable or familiar with either. Uh, so high on the pain scale, uh, something I don't currently don't feel comfortable to teach to even graduate students or you know like peer collaborators. If we're writing something in our markdown, I would say leave the Docker to me. Uh, you know I don't feel comfortable to to kind of uh, have you suffer through making sense of that. Um, so so high complexity implement for most researchers. If you already have lots of like system level experience, you will be totally fine. But if like me, you started learning R to do analysis and visualization in your field and you don't have much sort of um, you know, operating system experience, you, this may be your experience. But the upshot is you're way up here in terms of long-term reproducibility. 
maximum portability and encapsulation of the research compendium, all of the other things on that, are, that the computer needs to make your R code work are documented and supplied uh, in the Docker file and the Docker container once it's running. So, so for me, I will only, um, you know, I don't, so Carl Burdicker, whom I mentioned earlier as one of the sort of pioneers of this um, layered thinking about reproducibility, I had watched him use his computer once at, a, at an, a, an event, just sort of sitting next to him and everything on his computer operates in a Docker container, his email, a Docker container, uh, you know, the web browser, it's in a Docker container, R Studio, a Docker container. And it just was wild. I was like, oh my gosh, you start and stop Docker containers and switch between them. And I thought there's someone who's made a really serious commitment to making sense of <laughs> Docker. And for me, I'm kind of the opposite. I want as minimal, like least, uh, exposure to it as possible. So I will have a Docker container on GitHub and then I will have GitHub actions uh, run that Docker file, generate the Docker container and then run my code inside the Docker container on GitHub actions, not at all on my computer. I don't want it anywhere near my computer uh, because that is because that will satisfy me that my that I, I'm using this uh, tool that gives me maximum portability and encapsulation. My code runs inside it, but I don't really want to be spending a lot of time with it on my computer day to day. I've only found a couple of occasions where it's been necessary to run the Docker container of a project that, you know, we did the project, the paper was published and I sort of stopped working on it. And then I was like, oh, I need to regenerate that figure and change it slightly. Couldn't get it to work at all on my sort of normal desktop in, top environment. And so I know I will, I will run the Docker container that I bundle everything in and I will do the work inside the Docker container and sort of saved myself, but that's really a rare thing uh, for me. So, so that's sort of my reflection on this part here. So I would say, you know, if you get to here, you really deserve like serious recognition for your investment of time, your tolerance of pain, your commitment to reproducibility. I would say this is a, this is a profound kind of level of, of commitment uh, to, to making it reproducible. I got a fifth layer. This is the final one. It's probably, it's, it isn't really a substantial increase in pain and difficulties. I think it's probably equivalent. It might, there's been a, it might even be easier. There are, there have been some developments lately that make this um, probably more pleasant actually than working with a Docker file. I put it as the fifth one because it's basically the same technology. So Binder uses Docker containers and Docker files to operate. But in terms of the, the user, like you and I as the researcher wanting to um, operate these, actually I think it's probably not, not such an unpleasant experience. But but now we're right here. You know, this is thoroughly, definitely a place that you go when you when you really need to procrastinate from doing something else, writing a grant application or preparing a class or something, and you and you kind of uh, don't don't mind all the um, discomfort that comes along with it. So, what is Binder? A cloud service. Um, so. Um, there are some limitations as a free cloud service, obviously like how much memory is available to us as the user and how much compute time is available. It's pretty low. This is not a place where you can put on your sort of multi-hour uh, op operation, uh, but what it allows you to share a, your reproducible uh, computing environment from a code repository. And so for most people, this means uh, GitHub. So if you have a GitHub repository with your R markdown file on it, you can, um, put a button on your GitHub repository uh, that will allow someone to click on it and open in another tab, another browser tab, an instance of say our studio that includes all of the files of that GitHub repository. And then the user assuming they're familiar with our studio can uh, open the R markdown file in this instance of our studio in their browser and then run the code in there. So no download, no install. It's really, it's very elegant sort of way to have a an instant little museum display or gallery display of your of your research in the browser. Uh, so I think I have an yeah I have an example. This is a package called a Hole Punch that's been developed relatively recently uh, that makes working with this quite a lot um, quite pleasant compared to working with Docker files. Although this, what it does is generate a Docker file for you. So you. Um, you have your um, your material on GitHub. Let's say your research compendium, an RMAGDAO file, and some data files. The user clicks on this button. It starts an instance of Binder in the browser tab, and then they have our studio here. You can see in the browser tab with the same files that are on the GitHub uh, repository. So very nice kind of very smooth kind of integration of several technologies to kind of just make this work. And I have an example of a recent one 
this was a paper I was involved in, uh, you know, one of hundreds of co-authors. And perhaps my main contribution was this kind of, you know, comp bringing computational reproducibility to the, to the project, um, talking about when did the Anthropocene begin, like the time when um, humans became the main agent of sort of um, geological transformation. We had the paper, we had probably you're familiar with the conversation as sort of a place where people do sort of plain English translations of their scholarly work. And then we also had uh, a GitHub repository with our binder button here. And here on the right hand side is an animation, just a GIF of what happens when you click that binder button. And you can see it, it spins up a bit and then our studio appears in the browser. And then you can see me just clicking on the R markdown file. And I think I'm gonna knit it or run some code. You can probably recognize, you know, there's text there and there's code sort of woven throughout there. It's just scrolling down. You can see I've got some objects in the environment already. And then I'm gonna run a block of code there. And then it just runs right there in the console. And I think we're gonna get a figure somewhere. Yeah, there's a figure there, one of the figures in the, in the paper. So just a really nice way to, to give uh, people tires to kick from your research. You know, you know, they can read the paper, they can run the code, they can change the code slightly there, right there in the, uh, in the browser. And then, you know, let's say they're not satisfied with some of the assumptions you've made, uh, they can just uh, put their own assumptions in and run the code and see how does it look. As I said, there's some limitations um, in terms of runtime and memory, but for many, you know, I think probably many typical social science projects and, and some natural science one, this is quite a sensible, way to communicate your research in a very interactive way uh, that allows people to kind of play uh, and explore. So I'm quite, I'm quite keen on this and try to try to put this onto my GitHub repositories for papers that, for which it makes sense. You know, if the, if the computer is very long, then it's just gonna be frustrating for people to do this uh, in the browser and I, and I will not do it. Or I will try to like have those, pack, have those steps done in advance. So the reader or the user is just then making the plot or has, some places where they can interact with some of the analytical decisions, but they don't, you know, we skip the very time consuming computation. So there can be a little bit of, uh, this can be a little bit of a fork in the analysis if you have to do a lot of kind of uh, bespoke handling to make it work in bind. It might not be worth your effort to do that. Um, you know, if you have to do a lot of extra work to make it run within the runtime that's affordable, probably I would suggest not doing that. But if the runtime is not excessive, I uh, highly recommend it. Um, Okay, so Binder, I only suggest that put it up here because sometimes a bit of tinkering in the Docker file is required to, to manage some of the system dependencies. Um, but usually it's actually not that bad. And then I think it's quite you know, sort of equivalent to Docker in giving because it's, it's making your code run in a Docker container and it's making it accessible in a way that maybe a normal Docker container isn't. So, you know, if you, it's all great to have a Docker file and maybe a Docker container and Docker hub, but then someone has got to be able to make sense of that and make it run on their computer. With Binder, they don't really have to worry too much about that. They just click on the button and they've got what is likely a, a very familiar environment to most, to most people in your research community who are, who are using R. So, so I really recommend this. I think it's a, a triumph of, of kind of cloud and, analytical and sort of, you know, research computing technology. Uh, so, so that's a great, a great place to think of the, at the middle of the onion that sort of the most painful layer. So thinking of individual plants, you know, our papers, individual plants, I just want to like torture the metaphor, the botanical metaphor a bit more <laughs> and extend it out to the thought, to the idea of this work and the work of our communities as being like uh, a garden. Uh, you know, garden of many plants. And some of you may know where this is. Does, does anybody recognize this location? It's in Australia. I did look for a suitable garden in Wollongong because the botanical gardens are quite pretty, but this one captures no. the what I want. Sorry, what's that? I was just saying, no, I don't recognize it. Oh, uh, that's okay. It's the it's the King's Park Garden in Perth. So I grew up in Perth and this is a this is a scene of my childhood and I have very fond memories of this garden and the clock. This is a scene from like renovations of a couple of years ago. So you can see it's like a working clock and it's a garden. So it's just a sort of ridiculous, ornate, complicated, functional garden. And my main point uh, to introduce this is, is that it requires maintenance, like continuous maintenance to make it uh, useful. 
and uh, and practical and kind of enduring. And so we, I think it's it's helpful to think of our research, especially of the computational elements of research, in that way. Like it's all very well to have all to make your way through all the layers of the onion to the binder and Docker file, uh, but but. To be honest, we do need to think of it as like a thing that requires ongoing work to make it useful. So you can have your Docker file and you can say, okay, we're gonna forget about it, but probably in 10 years time, that's not gonna work. You know, and, and it might be worth if this is a project that has you could sort of re return to or is central to uh, many other projects to give it a bit of maintenance, uh, you know, trimming or, you know, as we do in a garden, checking in on it, updating the dependencies, to ensure it's valuable to you and to your, to your research community. So I think, you know, we've got the onion as kind of the, the metaphor of the individual project and perhaps a garden as like a collection of projects and the, the thought of needing to continuously uh, revisit, maintain and sort of weed out and whatnot in order to ensure their um, value into the future. Okay, so just to uh, finish off with a few sort of uh, broader thoughts about what, should we be then doing uh, with all of this, this tooling and kind of uh, motivation and so on? And there are a couple of concepts uh, more broadly um, that I just want to mention to you, and you may have heard already, the, the notion of fair research. So um, just to spell it out, find, making research findable. So the, the connection to what I've spoken about earlier is about um, putting things on a compendium, a, a repository, a data repository where you can get a DOI and they have a long-term commitment to making things uh, accessible on the internet. And part of, and so the DOI you can see is kind of the cartoon and the kind of, like, a, a proxy for accessibility of research. The DOI is not a miraculous guarantee, but it's probably a lot better than many of our other options, such as like putting a data file in a supplementary file for a journal article, for example. Uh, and then the I in this fair kind of guidance is interoperability. And you can see the little cartoon character saying, how do you open this .xyxzq file? And so this is why I'm why I've talked about using an open source programming language, right? Because they tend to be uh, interoperable with many uh, environments and files, and proprietary files and systems don't always age well, and can be have, have, be not very good in terms of interoperability and reusability. This uh, this may not be as intuitive as the others. What's referenced in the cartoon here is a Creative Commons license. And so, you know, our packages are required or often have a license file. And I think we should be doing the same thing for our research products is attaching a license to them to indicate the degree of reusability that we want. And, and in most cases, most people, I think, high, you know, it's basically open, um, uh, as open as possible is normally the case. But in some cases, we may want to prevent them, prevent commercial reuses. And there are certain Creative Commons that licenses that can uh, be used for that. Another acronym that has appeared uh, somewhat more recently, just 2020, it sort of in response to maybe ethical considerations around use, collection use and um, sharing of data is this one here. And so just to spell it out, collective benefit, um, authority to control. This is a good one about um, you know, who, has, who can decide about where the data should go. So putting a data on a repository it's usually my first thought, but then I will want to check with other people, like colleagues who've been involved in the collection of it about, are they okay with that? Does it make sense for them? And do they want to have control over who can access and so on? Uh, responsibility. And so many of these are kind of like social and sort of diplomatic aspects of, of uh, generating or collecting or working and sharing with data. And you can see mention of indigenous languages and worldviews, especially when, for researchers who are working uh, directly with um, uh, uh, minority groups or groups that uh, have potential for being harmed for if the data are uh, disseminated or treated in certain ways. And the obvious example of this are things about um, genetic data, uh, for example, and there's quite, quite a bit of uh, discussion about like the, the ethics of uh, DNA and ancient DNA and what, how, how, those, how conclusions are um, shared and uh, discussed there. Not something I have really any experience with, not central to my work, but I just am um, aware that those are the communities where these discussions are particularly vibrant. And finally, the E in care is ethics, minimizing harm and maximizing benefit. As an archeologist, I mostly am thinking about like location data. If I publish location of a site, you know, in an Excel file with a journal article, is someone gonna 
find it and go to that site and, and loot it perhaps because they've written they can see i've written about um you know uh, precious uh, kinds of artifacts like metal or glass or something there. and things uh, things a bit outside of my kind of day-to-day -day work but you probably have heard of things about um you know facial recognition and uh, data that's used to determine gender and race for example using machine learning has some there's uh, there's some quite, um active ethical discussions around that uh, as well. So things to guide you in your quest for reproducibility. Uh, and my final comment is about integrating this into teaching and learning. So it's all very well for us as sort of scholars to be to be exploring this in our research work, but we also need to be having it sort of trickle down or back into our teaching so that our students are ready to uh, to do this as they you know, go into graduate programs or go into professional work and it's and to sort of uh, to kind of push the needle a little bit on norms of uh, conducting research so um, um i've talked i've written a little bit here and this this is a paper in archaeology journal where we talk about how we have an assignment uh, that teaches students how to work reproducibly and and why and so they take a a journal article that includes code and data and then they select one of the journal one of the figures from that article and then um sort of write by all by themselves or adapt some of the code they can find to recreate that journal that figure of that journal article and extend it slightly change it in some way to get a feel for what is it like to to make to uh, to make their own figure and then to work with other people's stuff as well and so i and i think this is a thing that can be done in any kind of empirical uh, discipline. Uh, any field that uses numbers can probably have this kind of assignment uh, somewhere along the way. And you may already know that in the, in economics, at least I know in the US and many economics programs, it's kind of a rite of passage for graduate students in economics to reproduce uh, finding a classic finding in the field because many of their data sets are sort of public um, you know, like government data. So this is something that can I think can be done in many disciplines, especially as um, the availability and, and you know people like you and I do more reproducible research, there's more raw material for students to do these assignments on. But if you're not in a discipline that's using R or Python, uh, you still can probably find some data from a repository and students can work in Excel, for example. Students can collect or generate their own data and submit that data file as part of their assignment as a thing that's assessed on to indicate its value as a, as a, as a research product uh, or as a sort of supplementary thing. You, you can have peer peer-to-peer uh, -peer kind of reproduction um, projects as well, where one student will try to recreate the steps of another. I haven't tried this, uh, but I've heard of other people doing it. It sounds quite interesting. So definitely options for promoting um, reproducible thinking and the importance of transparency and reproducibility, even if you're not using a scripting language in class. I know many of you, Many people will teach in programs where you don't have the freedom to just freely introduce new assignments or teach R when that's you know the curriculum requires SPSS. There are still things that can be done um, in a sort of uh, sideways fashion. So finally, implications for this uh, for preparing the students. You know, if we accept that it's necessary to work reproducibly, teach students the importance of this. And Rika did mention the the T-shaped researcher. And I like to talk about the gamma-shaped researcher. You may also have heard of the pie-shaped researcher. Uh, so the pie-shaped researcher is kind of in between these two here. The T-shaped researcher having their domain specialty and then sort of some breadth of knowledge across a variety of other uh, kind of cognate fields maybe. And, and here we suggest the gamma-shaped researcher. So you probably recognize this uh, Greek letter gamma. Maybe I should specify that this kind of serif is really what they, is really the thing to draw your attention to where the student has their domain specialty, they have their breadth and kind of cognate fields, and then they have a little bit of a dipping their toes, let's say, into reproducibility and computing skills. So, you know, earlier literature and some other people will still talk about the pie-shaped researcher where you've got this domain specialty, you know, the graduate student will spend several years on their, on their PhD research, and then the pie-shaped researcher, they will spend the same amount of time and energy learning computing skills and reproducibility. And for many people, of course, that is completely an unfeasible thing to do. Like nobody has the time or resources to put the same level of effort into their PhD work as to learning about Docker and, and you know, um, Binder and GitHub and so on. It's not realistic. Uh, and few programs can afford to resource the students sufficiently to get to that same level of depth. So this is a much more realistic um, kind of extent, I think, that a student can be suitably prepared to do that the average instructor or advisor can kind of manage and the, and the student 
has the stomach for, let's say they can sort of appreciate that level of investment, but probably not this one. You know, this is kind of not, this is the one in 100 student that's going to be that. This is the typical graduate student there. So this is kind of uh, the, think, the thinking I sort of bring to my um, uh, graduate students and, and what I see happening amongst other colleagues who are who have an interest in reproducible research as well. So that brings me to, to the end. So thanks so much. I think probably gone a little bit over time, so sorry about that. But thank you for the opportunity to explore the idea of thinking about reproducibility in terms of layers and to sort of showcase some of the technology that I think is the the thing to go for if you're not familiar with, if you're interested in moving um, between those layers. So 